Right, and we are back from that magic break. And now joined by Mr. Lauren Lanning. I am very glad to have you here. It's an honor to the podcast and all of us, just like Amy. Um, and yeah, I'm honored too. Well, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> just trying to be, you know, keep be fair there with the introductions. And also, uh, I didn't get Lauren's title incorrect from the beginning anyway. So it, it, who are you anyway? I'm president and co-founder of Oddworld Inhabitants and I work under the boss. Under Sherry the boss? McKenna. Yeah, the CEO. Hi, boss. <laughs> So I always cringe when there's someone who goes, Lauren Lanning, CEO. I'm like, oh, shit, oh. kill me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we, we've been, we run down a quick uh, little glimpse at what we saw on the first day of GDC, a little IGF stuff. Let's, let's do what we came here for, which is talk about character games, right? Where should we start? You saw, you saw the questions, Amy. So I glimpsed them, yes. Where I, where I thought we'd kick off this conversation is talking about where the creative process for you guys t- starts in building a compelling uh, character-driven adventure game. You want to lead this? Big qu- oh, yeah, I want to lead the whole <laughs> yeah. thing. That's, that's what go I want to do. Push her there off you go. <laughs> Hold on, I have a hand grenade. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's, boy, these are hard questions to answer, actually, because if there were magic answers, then we'd probably write books or be a lot better at what we do or something, but you just, it's a messy process, and it's iterative. I mean, that's really the thing. If you sit down thinking that you're going to get it all figured out in one go, and you're going to have some flash of inspiration, then you're doomed. It's working with a lot of people with a lot of different ideas, iterating on those ideas again and again, doing a lot of research and reading and getting inspired by different things, letting things just sort of marinate. You know, I mean, it's its organic, right? Yeah. It's, its you know, and then, and then I admit, you know, we always came from it from a slightly different approach from most game designers that I know, and I think their approach is smarter. <laughs> so I don't, I don't claim that this is the right way at all. But um, for me, it was it was like, I didn't design games because I wanted to be a game designer. I designed games because I wanted to create characters that people really connected to, that were connected to issues that I thought were important. You know, and and it, so it was like the idea of doing more Coke commercials or more of the things that, you know, we've done plenty of in the past just had lost all appeal to me and it was about well how do we you know if we sit down and eat a bag of chi- potato chips you know it tastes great while we're eating it but then when you're done you might have spent an hour and you were eating it it was great but when you're done you're just empty but you're full of some shit and it has no real value <laughs> that's, you that's know? the kind of game I make <laughs> <laughs> but I saw the ending to Uncharted I, I feel you oh. <laughs> oh. let's not do that yet alright oh, oh, really? that's so round two here. <laughs> before we get to that though, she knows I love the game I mean, since we have Amy and Lauren here I mean it's different I, I see a big difference between the odd world quintal and Uncharted. I mean, to pick like your most recent game versus your oldest game, but like mm-hmm. un- Oddworld has what appears to me an uncompromising approach. Like no one could have told you maybe these guys shouldn't look slimy, maybe they should <laughs> be plush and lovable so the kids will put them on a happy meal. Whereas Uncharted seems to be more, you know, like you really thought about marketability and what these characters look like, and like, you change the way the woman looks, you know, like from early to later. And, you know, not as much as you th- really, not as much as you think. Because I'm wondering where like the art and commerce and compromising. To meet expectations, where you guys fall in that? <laughs> well, obviously, that's as a big question. Creative people, <laughs> you want to be as dicked with as little as possible, right? right? Mm-hmm. And actually, the beauty of, for me anyway, working with with Sony is our relationship as Naughty Dog is we don't really get messed with very much. And there's so Sony didn't say give her longer hair. That, no, that never no, happened. No, no, no. no. I mean, <laughs> it's this is the iteration, right? And if you're an open and kind of forthright game studio like Naughty Dog is, people are going to see your work in its iterations, not just in its final state. Mm -hmm. And uh, early versions of Drake didn't look great. Early versions of Elena didn't look great. But you saw them as they went along. And uh, if people then interpret that as sort of focus testing, yeah, that's, come that, up with a lot something. of people thought that. Like I don't know if that's just maybe the, the you know the way journalists look at it now. We're trying to find bunch of cynical bastards. <laughs> yeah, trying right. to find a conspiracy and everything. <laughs> it, well, I've been called worse. <laughs> I wish. I wish. You know, like <laughs> please get on CBS, NBC, friendly. <laughs> please find the conspiracy. So, so yeah, and it was purely an internal process. <clears throat> I mean, the fact was. I mean, we, we're all very vocal with each other, and we weren't happy with certain things. Or, And believe me, like, I mean, there's a company of 75 people. I'm one of about five women there. So we got into some heated discussions about was she hot enough and all this stuff, and you know, from which I put my hands on my hips and stomped away plenty of times. But um, it's... It, you know, it's an internal process. We looked at it and said, you know, we're not getting the hair shaders right. We haven't modeled it right. Start again, start again, start again. But, it, no, it wasn't focus tested to look like they just stepped out of, you know, 
Urban Outfitters or right. something like that, which is, I think, how it got perceived, that it was all very calculated. In fact, it was just what appealed to us. But like, no one ever accused Oddworld of looking calculated. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say, how does that compare to <laughs> yeah, like, what, is, what, what, what can you add to that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, you know, it, it's like, I think f- focus testing with lack of vision on a product, meaning so that the, typically the marketing department, the publishing, the financing, whatever end it is that that's footing the bill, you know, they want to know, well, is this going to be appealing? So focus testing, if there's not a strong vision on the product, is a way to just sort of guarantee mediocrity, you know? I mean, really. Garnet's applause. I you love know. that point. You know I love <laughs> that point. <laughs> I you know, I mean, let's look at I film, I think it's right? such a good point. Let's look at, like, everyone goes, oh, you know, I don't think, like, with Oddworld, actually, I looked at it and I went, I want to create anti-heroes that are not who you want to be, right? That are just pathetic schmucks. And then let's put them in some circumstances where you don't want to be. And let's, mm-hmm. let's like, like, elevate them out of instead it. Instead of, uh, you know, fulfillment fantasy, it's like you don't want to fulfill this yeah. fantasy. But part of it was, was the belief that, I mean, from a purely marketing perspective as well, aside from, like, the artistic, you know, goal and ideal of it, was that, you know, cutting through... You know, we had come out, and my my partner goes back in commercials and stuff and has more Clio awards than anyone in the world. I mean, it's sick, right, from the early days of computer graphics. And what they focused on all the time was how to cut through, how to make Mm -hmm. it different, right? We are in a game business that says, well, how do we make it more like that? (laughs) <laughs> you know, from from right. and, and we wonder why like more people aren't authentically interested in games. We wonder why you know the 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 market isn't really changing. We wonder why every year Douglas would go up, you know, Douglas Lowe and Steve would go up at CES or Dice or or, or uh, E3 and say we need to get innovative. You know, and then we can understand all the yeah. all the marketing conditions and all the financing conditions and the escalating retarded costs of developing on a new system, which is which is just you know bozo logic. But all of those things homogenize and normalize and make the products less interesting quite frankly right and we looked at it but we were coming from like how do we make the best 15 second super bowl commercial i mean that was our history right or you got a filmmaker comes in and he's absolutely demanding and he's going this shot needs to be no one's ever seen it before you know this came from my (laughs) movie and this is i'm an auteur and so you think slightly differently you don't think like how what did well and how do we mimic that you think where is the audience mind share at and what are they waiting for that no one's giving them? So part of the funkiness of Oddworld was about creating something that was just so different it would cut through. I mean, that, that was part of the logic. Well, and having anti-heroes instead of like steroided out guys, you know, right. having really sort of pathetically weak dudes. Yeah. And the irony was for us, if you look at our game, it doesn't actually look like other games out there. Now, you might look at those characters in another context and go, well, they seem pretty generic. But that actually was the design decision is that we wanted them to look like real people. But and they're not in space armor, and they don't have enormous breasts, either one of them. Right. And and uh, they're not. It's that one slipped through. Huh? <laughs> that, Isn't it a requirement no, that, now? That yeah. was a huge fight, Lauren. You would not believe it. Oh, I do. The I conversations. Do. So, you know, that's actually kind of the ironic reaction for me is when I hear that our characters seem like that they, if they, if people think they look focus tested, well, then they would have had massive muscles, huge tits been in space armor, had no hair. I mean, I don't know. Well, it's, it, it's interesting you say that, because I remember when I saw the trailer for Uncharted, like the last trailer, like you know, before it came out, I remember thinking, well, this game looks so mundane, but that's kind of what's cool about it, is if you were watching, if this was a TV show on NBC, mm-hmm. and, you, and you saw this commercial, like a 30-year-old dude wouldn't be embarrassed to buy that game, whereas like if it was something, you know, like really fanciful, he, he might not, but it's, it's interesting, because it is almost realistic into a mundane way. That was actually the risk for yeah. us, is to go... <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's weird, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's backwards of what you think. And we're talking about sort of the same thing that Lauren was talking about, which is that you had this vision for it creatively of this is what these characters need to be. This is what this game needs to look like. And regardless of whether some focus testing group or some outward pressure said, oh, she needs to be this archetype or that archetype, you were able to stick to your guns. Where are we? Yeah. Like, where do you see us now? This is kind of a bigger picture question. Where do you think the game design uh, group is as a whole with regard to being able to push back. The subject came up at Dice. You know, they were talking about there, there were people who were challenging developers to push back against their publishers more. Are we there yet? How close are <laughs> no we? No way. I mean, we're, I I mean look at Oddworld Stranger. I mean, that's pushing back big time. I mean, that that character. I mean, that I just thought that was such a, for, especially for that time. Was it two, three years ago? That was so yeah. different from what you expected. You know, but it was a little bit more of a relatable character than the other guys. Yeah. <laughs> but still, it was so 
I mean, remember when we went to go watch it? It was years too soon now with the proliferation of furries on yeah. the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Could have been a multi-million dollar, I mean, multi-million Well, yeah, you know, I mean, it, I mean, it's, it's like those are always sore spots in history, right? Because you go, well, okay, what's the most anticipated game this year? And then let's look at the marketing budget of that. And you go, wait a minute. If this is the most anticipated game, why does it have more marketing and advertising dollars than any other game? I mean, it's a very simple thing, right? What's the most anticipated movie? The one everyone's looking forward to. Well, that, that's the one that's going to have the biggest marketing campaign. You take away the marketing campaign. You take away the sales. So people oftentimes ask me, they go, why do you think that didn't sell? Why do you think this didn't sell? And I don't have sour grapes on it, but you don't sell shit in today's retail environment if you don't promote. No, absolutely and if you're not. And if you're on an acquisition trail as a publisher and you're trying to figure out how to own a company, then maybe you won't promote its titles that you took on the distribution right. for. And then maybe you get a better buyout price. And then maybe you're dealing with someone who goes, ha! <laughs> we don't play that game, you know, and it can backfire like it did in the case of, right. of uh, you know, our publisher at that time. S- sent to die. <laughs> but I look at it, I look at it and I go, phrase. you know, the, 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 everyone's always trying to follow, copy the hit, right? And then that's never the hit. Let's look at Lord of the Rings as the movie, right? Then we have Golden Compass. Then we have, uh, you know, these other ones that are trying to follow and trying to, to, to get there. And some of them do really well, right? But no one in their right mind would have financed Lord of the Rings, the trilogy. And in fact, no one in their right mind did finance it. Well, if yeah. you look, at, look, was, look at New Line now. <laughs> yeah. Well, what, what New Line did was they financed that movie as a poison pill to avoid a hostile takeover. Yeah. Right? Like it was like, it was Peter Jackson's trying to sell him two movies. Yeah. And he's going, you know, so it's a, and the guy's going, wasn't that a trilogy? He's going, well, yeah, it was. Well, let's make all three. You know, he tried to make such a huge investment that they couldn't have a hostile takeover. So the corporate sort of dark arts is really what enabled that miracle to get built. It never would have been built through the normal, the normal financing sort of checks and balances of Hollywood, you know, sell it to the marketing department. How is this going to go? And then we have something that's extraordinary because it's built out on an island, you know, in the middle of the Pacific, and no one's really – it's hard to get there, so you're not going to have your executives flying out every day, kind of like how we did Oddworld. You know, we went to the <laughs> Central Coast so that they couldn't drive over from L.A. or San Francisco too easily. It's like, let's hide and build our game there you know, and I mean, see what happens. I think asking developers to push back against publishers, it's crazy. But more and more you're hearing about, you know, developers being snapped up, having their original IP canceled and being put on a licensed product. That's still happening every, yeah. every day. Yeah. Well, what's happening, too, is <laughs> yeah. that, you know, as, as I mean, all the publishers are largely public companies, right, for the most part. And so they have, the, they're answering to their shareholders more than they are their audience. Yep. And as a result, they're, they're going, you know, how, how do we look if we're putting something creative out there and it fails? Do we look dumb? You know, do we look like some of those bodies on the side of the road that used to be called publishers, too? You know, how do we what's the smartest approach for us in this marketplace? And what we see then is they go, what are we financing and do we own the IP? So now they might have found out late in the game. This is why we started a game company, because the game industry at the time did not understand that there was any value in sequels. So if you talk to the game companies, they go, it was like talking to Fox. It was like Lucas talking to Fox in 1974, right? It's like, no, there's no, um, there's no money in licensing. Sure, you can have those rights. That's how it was <laughs> yes. in games in 1994, right? So we were like, yeah. You know, we, we were like, that's why we're here. Cool, no money in sequels. Well, 10 years later, they're completely hip to, oh, it's all about brand. We don't want to finance anything that we don't own the IP on, which all of a sudden for the creators, you go, oh, you know, it's a lot less interesting now because basically when we look at properties that have really been built into something that have huge audiences, you know, Star Wars or Lord of the Rings is great examples, you know, and let's just look from the film dates on, you know, Peter Jackson's version on. It was handled with such care and integrity and non-intuitive thinking for what the mass audience would like. You know, he and his wife working on that script to death, making sure those characters are speaking in languages. We don't even understand half the shit they're saying. <laughs> but it's like, wow, they really believe this shit, you know? <laughs> and, and Peter Jackson on the set going, this is not a fantasy movie. This is a period piece, you know? And like, this is not, fa- you know, off the set. You think this is a fantasy we're making? Off the I mean, this is like hardcore hey, those guys faith. Got, they got tattoos and shit. Yeah, they did. faith <laughs> in the vision, you know? Faith in right. like how they built those weapons and things. So we don't have that when we have a, a sort of collective idea of what's going to sell, which is largely sort of the, the today in films, television, and, and games, it's all pretty much, unless you're coming in at really low budgets, it's all pretty much big hit or nothing, blockbuster weekend or nothing. What, right? You're putting it all on the publisher, but what if the publisher you know, were to retort that, well, it's because 
the people out there aren't willing to pay for this thing? I mean, what is the actual limiting yeah. factor to the creativity? I mean, is it? Well, you go, you go, you know, if all we're measuring is metrics from history, then we never actually have the, the algorithm that says this is what's a hit in the future. Right? It always has to have someone with some vision, someone with some daring perspective to say, we're going to do something a little different. You know, we believe that. I mean, look at Naughty Dog, right? When the, mm-hmm. when in the, jack, in the uh, uh, crash stuff, they go, we're not going to try and do this. this, this, this. We're going to do very, very specifically this type of gameplay. And everyone's going, well, shouldn't it be f- free world? Because it's 3D now, you know? And you're like, yeah, those guys are all dying over there. <laughs> like, like horses in the desert with no water, right? They're shriveling up and dying because they can't figure out like how to keep the gamer engaged and tell them where to go. So they focused on a very specific, not necessarily, I mean, if you, you were talking to guys at Sony back in that day, it wasn't necessarily while they were building it. They had faith that those guys would come up with something decent, but they had no idea that it was going to be as big as it, would, it, as it was. But they stuck to their vision, and at that time, I think vision mattered more, whereas today it's like vision is something where, you know, we were, we were also dealing with publishers back in the day where the guys that were running the show actually built games and had a history of building mm-hmm. games. It's kind of like Hollywood back in the 30s or 40s, right? We had these, these guys, and, and this is, you know, the, the moguls, the Jewish moguls of Hollywood. But they were filmmakers. Like, they loved film. And even if they weren't, if they were bankers, but they were running studios, they loved the idea of how film could change the world around them. So you had, you know, Jewish guys building It's a Wonderful Life. You know, that we're trying to, like, build the American dream in the public mind the way they wanted to see America. So they cared so much about what that content was. You go back to Motown, the guys that were doing the labels. You right, know, right. What kind of music did they care about? What, what was in it? What, what wasn't someone else picking up that they knew there would, had to be an audience for because the music had so much soul? And, you know, what's happened is, is that as, as companies become public, as they become larger entities, as they become, you know, billion dollars a year, plus, 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 now the, the biggest thing they're afraid of is their shareholders. Or being delisted, or, you know, watching their stocks sit at a dollar for ten years. From the corporate you know. standpoint, yeah. But now those are the guys that are running it, because the guy that's going to run the company is the guy who can talk to Wall Street. It's not the guy who can talk to the game designers. So you go, you know, I mean, like um, a lot of these big publishers, the CEO. He isn't even going to know who that you guys did right. a deal with. I mean, he's talking to Wall Street. To interject, I think a big part of Nintendo's mammoth success is that their president, Mr. Iwata, he is a game creator, a gamer, and he's like a sweet dude. He talks to everybody. I mean, mm-hmm. we, we've met him, and he, he cares about games. You actually get that from him. He reads message boards. He reads message boards. He reads magazines. But he, he made games, so he understands games, and yeah, it's no surprise that Nintendo owns half the industry. Let me, well, and now they're what? Number two <laughs> entertainment company in the world? Right. Yeah. And, I mean, and they took risks. They, they did the, the Blue Ocean thing. They went, they had, they went they after where nobody else is going. Everything you're talking about is what Nintendo win did. So let me bring this to a different case point, because in Uncharted, Mm -hmm. you guys, Naughty Dog has created a a franchise starter to me, something that looks to definitely have a a great potential future to it, and you know, as... Hopefully not a spoiler to too many people, but as the character rides off into the uh, sunset, with a very classic, traditional, you're excited and you're thinking, wow, I wonder what other adventures this character can have. In the scheme of things like Lauren is talking about, how do you guys feel about the future of uh, the security of the future of Drake and, and the rest of the cast? Well, obviously we went into it hoping to build a franchise. I mean, that's if that sounds kind of pragmatic and, and cynical, it's not. It's only because there's such a huge well, investment. Well, you, ha- you have to. Yeah, I mean, such you a have huge to. investment in your engine and your and your and your uh, uh, and, and the IP that you know if you hit, you really want to be able to keep exploring that and 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 that's where you kind of get your investment back. Um, but uh, you know, I think. I'm trying to think, like, what's the best way to answer this? But, um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I don't know. I sometimes, I, sometimes I'm jealous of other game developers where I see that they just make, you know, one game, you know, and they move on to another one. I mean, I know Tim Schafer does that a lot, and it's, it's, it's. You know. How about how about the struggle then of? I mean, you have a new IP. Mm-hmm. You're on a new piece of hardware that's still selling into the marketplace very strongly. I mean, we know that that not everybody who would like to have a PS3 probably has one. There's still people on the fence. So you don't have that huge install base yet. So it's hard to even document, well, you know, what is the potential of this franchise? I see what you're saying. Yeah. Um, Well, I mean, the response has been pretty good, and our sales have been pretty good considering, um, you know, being up against that, being on a single platform, things like that. And uh, certainly, you know, 
in the black, which is great. And uh, I think so now that we're seeing that the you know the installed base of the PS3s is, is increasing, and the fact that you know Sony has other other ways of extending their their franchises beyond just the single platform, um, you know we're all excited to to just sort of keep exploring and expanding it. And I think the reason we we chose the genre we did is because it's purpose built to be expanded upon. That right. you expect there to be continuing adventures. Um, that was a, that was definitely a conscious choice. Um, but again, not a cynical one. It was one that was because it was a genre we loved and we're excited about, and uh, that you know these are based on serials and cliffhangers, and and the idea that you're going to see these characters again and they're going to go through other adventures, and that being able to tap into that huge history of the genre is, is great fun because it's not not plagiarism; it's homage. You know what I mean? And, right. And, no, I mean, absolutely. It's just an homage to everything that came before and. And obviously, we're, we're, we are too. As an audience member, I gain more buy-in just thinking, wow, you know what? This is something where I expect to see the character down the road. So I want to learn more about Drake because that way I know his background when I'm in his next adventure or in his third adventure. And I, I understand where he's been and who he is and what his context is. I get all that stuff. Yeah, the trick, of course, is to yep. not fall into the trap. What? Well, I was just going to say, I mean, just the other side of that is Tomb Raider and what happened with Laura Croft. That right. Was, rather uh, than wanting another one, it got to the point where we wanted her to have a vacation for some time. And then... Yeah, but I also think about a lot of that is, A, the quality went down, and B, they were just shoving them out every year. I mean, like... That's the problem. I mean, I the every year that, thing. I mean, right. that's just too the, the thing, though, is this, it's just that Tomb Raider, for, for many gamers, and I think many, you know, PlayStation 3 owners and potential, you know, players of, of Drake, that is part of what's in their mind as much as the tradition of sure. you know, of the serial and, and the cliffhanger ending and yeah. traditional and, and look at, you know look at it at a, at a more macro level too right it has the brand naughty dog on it right, right? so this is one of the things that Smoney, sony excuse me is being <laughs> smart about is not extinguishing a very visible quality brand label to the gamers right so mm-hmm. so anything that you guys come up with the audience is going to be curious about no matter right. what because they have a history of totally solid games that become franchises and drive sales for hardware. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can right. tell that because yeah, when the yeah. game was first shown, it had no title. It was just you saw the Naughty right. Dog. Well, well uh-huh. I mean, that wasn't by choice. I, I know, but I'm just saying, like, it was. <laughs> it's a whole other that, story. It was yeah. proven that it, that was, that was yeah, I mean, important. Crash and yeah. Jack are like bellwether <laughs> franchises with really loyal fan bases. That because I know, for, because I know, for me, if I just seen that trailer and didn't see the Naughty Dog. Logo, I may be a little bit more See? pessimistic. See? I, that's, and that's true. And that's, that's for me. Possible. And that yeah. that's that actually gives Naughty Dog a lot of strength in saying we want to do something different, right? So they have a track record of saying, okay, here's these franchises that really stand out in the history of gaming, right? In their success and in their audience reception. And then you go, yeah, but we want to make this more, you know, Indiana Jones, cliffhanger ish, you know, and it's more human looking, and they're not as as extreme as our other characters and all. Now. Most developers would have a harder time selling them. Right, absolutely. We've been hugely fortunate in terms of you know, how mm-hmm. our working relationship with Sony, and I feel a little bit insulated in the sense that, you know, answering some of the questions you're just talking about, where, you know, how is it for developers working with publishers and can you push back? And I'm just thinking, well, we don't ever have to push at all. It just seems like it, it goes pretty smoothly if we're all making rational and y- creative choices, but I know that that's not the usual experience. And you guys are you guys are interfacing with like Shu Yoshida and stuff, right? Yeah, and the, yeah. Now, and then, this is a really important point, is that Shu, I'm a big fan of Shu's because here's a guy, he was like Ed Freeze in a lot of ways, you know? They, they both really cared about games. They both really wanted to see games go into new directions, and they both were very... Um, in a sense, fiercely protective of what they believed were the creative, cap- creative talents capable of actually delivering those games. But they have so much history, so much passion, so much love for the medium. Now we can go to other companies where someone just came over and now they're the president of this company from Procter & Gamble. Right? <laughs> How much vision do you think that person's going to have when it comes to backing creative uh, vision and passion on a new title that doesn't have a statistical history of this genre or something really yeah. selling? I remember uh, many years ago I was at a party um, with you know one of the ch- chief financial officers of one company. He said, and he just said, it's okay to make you know a Camry, a lot of Camrys. You know, we don't have to make <laughs> this. Uh, you know, we don't have to make the you know the Cadillac. We can make we can make these you know budget games. It's okay. Like they did, it was all about dollars and cents for them. In terms of publishers pushing back, I have to ask the Sobe drink placement in Munch was that was that Microsoft or was that something you guys? Oh, well, you lost your mic. Some. It was 
was it? Oh, yeah. Oh, try, sorry. Trying to dodge the question there, Lauren. <laughs> yeah. About the awesome <laughs> Sobe machine. Grab Lauren's feet, drag him back through the door. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just curious about that one. Because that was a pretty early, like, in-game advertising yeah. thing, actually. Yeah. Now it's know, commonplace. No, we were actually, you know, we were actually all for it because what happens is you're building really expensive games <laughs> and your ass is fully out on the line. <laughs> you know? It's like, you'll give us money? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Like, like <laughs> no, the, the, our heroes is dude in a wheelchair. You know, this is going to go over <laughs> real well. <right? laughs> it'll, 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 your beverage will be huge among the handicapped. This yeah. was actually the first time you met the CEO of Procter and Gamble. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, people are like, I don't know. And you're like, no, 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 man, come on. Shrek as a game, right? As a game. Let's say now I'm proposing a title and there's Shrek. He's a big, ugly ogre, right? What focus testing is going to say, yeah, that's going to win. But if you launch it as a movie, right. it mm-hmm. could be huge. So, like, like, I felt that Abe and Stranger and things like that were actually far more mass market characters. But the games medium is not really mass market yet. As long as we'd like to think it is, mm-hmm. it's not. Because mass market is like Pixar, right? And you can have a monster sink where, the, where Billy Crystal's voice has one eyeball. <laughs> yep. you know? And it's just like, it's not going to fly in the game industry before it gets to the audience. It, I, I believe it absolutely could when it hits the audience. Right. But it depends on you know, a lot of factors. And so... I think we were up against that a little bit, again, or ironically, with with Uncharted, is because it was sort of unexpected. And that's why, I mean, you know, listening to you guys talk about this, I wonder how fair it is to lay everything at the feet of the publisher. You know, I think developers have to own up to the fact that we have to bring more innovative ideas to the table. And I, I think sometimes there's a lack of creativity even within development community and <laughs> I think the media no offense is responsible and I think the fans are responsible well that's where that focus it. testing thing kicks in right yeah. is I mean my, my dear reason, reason I was applauding is that sure. having seen games is that I want a creative person to have such a strong spark for a game that when I sit down and play it it comes across and I feel it and I go through the whole game feeling it and I don't need focus testing to get that and they probably don't need you know what they need focus testing to get they need focus testing to help them figure out how to lay the controls across the control pad mm-hmm. right absolutely and, and how to do the like, HUD we don't when we say we focus test religiously, it's gameplay focus testing. Absolutely. It's after the concept phase. We don't lay pictures down on a table in front of 14-year-olds and get them to vet it. I mean, my, <laughs> right. that would be stupid. But there are cases of that happening all over the industry, right? Yeah. You know, where they're saying, this is what this character sure. should look oh, like. We, or this we, we see games all right. the time that you just can tell, okay, like this, well, this is the, based this, on this. this but I mean, disease. I feel like we have to push back ourselves against this. I mean, I, I mean, God bless him, I love him, so I'm not criticizing him here. But like Dave Halverson, his preview of um, of Uncharted, he was basically like, wow, this game's beautiful, it looks interesting, but ditch this guy, ditch the main character. He was saying, you know, he needs something. Why is he so generic? He's you know, I'm bo- thinking, what do you want, a top hat and a monocle? I mean, <laughs> the game, the I mean it's, it's, it's like saying, I mean... I'm a top on the monocle. Yeah, I mean, it's like, it's like to me, it's, that's, it's what you're talking about, Lauren. I mean, it's like looking at Kiefer Sutherland saying, in 24 and saying, well, well, it's great, but he needs some sort of costume. You know, I mean, why do we have to do that in our, in our genre? Now, to Dave's credit or or whatever i thank him for this he he wrote a glowing review of the final game and sort of said my god i take it back you know i thought he was generic and within 20 minutes i fell in love with i was in next to indiana jones and that's what i'm hoping we can do in our industry is get over that hump of having to be characters to be able to attract any attention or to be the same as some other games i flip through these gaming magazines and i swear my brain just goes to sleep because I just feel like I'm seeing the same well, thing page It's funny, we were just noticing page. like Sam Fisher, Star of Splinter Cell, he got like a beard, looks all, he looks all kind of rough now. There's yeah. four games now, they yeah. all I was looking through a game hair, and like, everyone beard. looks like scruffy Sam Fisher. I was like, so, is, it, is it like that the new look? I well, guess it is. What I'm saying. Do you think that's coming from the publishers or do you think the developers are just not being very well, imaginative? I, think, I sometimes wonder whether I mean, it's... I think what's happening is we kind of have a polluted cycle that's stifling itself. You know, and like when we see things like Club Penguin, <laughs> right? It really says, you know what, guys? You don't know what the hell you're doing. <laughs> well, yeah. Industry, right? It's just YouTube. <laughs> you know, we see these things happening. The writer strike right now. The 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 huge mistake that the studios and the and the networks are making and the, where the writer strike is. Last time there was a writer strike, they go, hey, we can hold out. You know, they'll all come back. Well, this time they got other things to do. So yeah. before we didn't have. Uh, iTunes playing our TV shows, our movies. We didn't have YouTube. We didn't have these things. So now their shows aren't are being canceled. You know, their shows have been delayed. You know, and like Sherry, a total fan. There's 13 shows she's not recording this year, right? They're not going back. That's the the sort of beauty of the greed factor imploding yeah. on itself. As you go, <laughs> statistically, you're saying well, last time we had a writer strike, 1987. You know, the, we we have a slump. We'll beat up the writers. We'll have them take less. We'll take everything. 
and they'll have nowhere else to go, and then the market will come back. Well, now the market's not going to come back. It has too many choices. And things like Club Penguin are a beautiful example of this, right, where everyone's kid was in there, and meanwhile, the game industry is saying, well, there's no, there's no market in kids. <laughs> right? Miss. <laughs> right? Miss. <laughs> You know, how to look stupid in the game industry. <laughs> right? And so what we have, which is really, here's a great example. You talk to the filmmakers, and they're really frustrated because they don't get to own their IPs. No matter who. Right. You, know, you name them except for George, they don't own their IPs. <laughs> and so they're trying, that's why they're all, that's why John Woo is constantly trying to do comic books or games. So they're trying to own IPs. Mm. They're trying desperately because they hate the studios. Right? They just, ah, you don't know what they put me through in that last film. You know. Then you get... The publishers talk to the directors because the directors want to make games, and the directors walk out of the room and go, I will never, ever work with those people. <laughs> I mean, how many times have we heard this? It's like big-name directors. It's right. just like, how do these game guys do it? But what's happening is the game guys, the game design people, are being so sort of conditioned by how to properly respond to the publishers that they also are having a super hard time communi communicating to the other talents in other industries. Right? Music, it's easier. You talk to someone like Nile Rodgers or something, doing the music. I mean, talk about convergence. That guy's a, a, a god in music history, you know? I mean, at, at unprecedented levels. And, and then he's like, no, man, I want to get young artists, like, totally into the games, man. But they're intimidated, you know? So he's, like, bridging that gap. Wow. But you don't have that happen with filmmakers. Filmmakers don't want to have the b discipline to really understand how, how hard games are. They want the money. Like, you know, Gore Verbinski at DICE was giving the keynote about, oh, I want to get into games because he saw how Disney mishandled pirates. And he's like, well, you know, I could have done it better, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, welcome so to the that. He <laughs> say that, but come on. <laughs> Before we get to a point where we're, we're out of time and I'll get to this, this is another big question I wanted to get while I have two folks who've handled this very well in their games is how do you balance out the need for a game to have character interaction for you to be doing things in the game and feel like you're, you know, op like you're influencing what's happening, but the, you know, the basic nature of a story has a, a beginning and a, and a linear path and then an ending. How do you, how do you balance that and make it work? Because both of you guys have succeeded in that. Well, it's, I think it's a bitch. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, hard. It's, it's really hard. Yeah, I mean, I, and I'm convinced now, and, and this sounds arrogant, I guess, and it's it's not. I think making games is way harder than making movies. And it's funny, I ran into Jason Rubin not too long ago, and now that he's branched into other media, he goes, oh my God, you know, if you can do this, you can do anything. <laughs> Absolutely. <basically." laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, I just, I, um... I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Well, when, uh, you story, <laughs> when, you storyboard out un when you storyboarded out Uncharted, for instance, how did you determine, well, this is where a character can have free oh, reign to do things, and, right. but this is where I need to bring him back to the story? Yeah, I, I you know, I, it's... Sorry. <clears throat> Go ahead, Lauren, because I'm going to... Well, you know, <laughs> it, it's now. interesting. Like, you know, in many ways, we're talking about how does ramping work with narrative. And... You know, I remember on Stranger, we started putting together new types of charts. And because I really, it, it was like the science was too pseudo, you know, it was too voodoo. And you're sitting there at the end making all these decisions. And you had someone like me in the studio going, it's not working. And then you got a producer going, yeah, well, it's done. And you're going, no, <laughs> yeah. you know, no, because the, if it doesn't work, it's not done because then we're done. Yeah. Meaning we'll be through. It's got to be great for the audience. That's who matters at the end. And our studio might be, our publisher might be pissed for different reasons that we should have buttoned down on this button. But no, we are leaving it open. We're going to fix that. And I think a lot of the challenge becomes like, how is the inherent nature of who the character is related to the play? Now, this is something like for Oddworld, like for Abe, I look at these characters and go, what do they as characters have that's very special that can give them unique game mechanics that don't come with other characters. So Abe was like, a, you know, he's kind of a wuss, right? But his, so his sneak became very, very important, right? His possession, like, well, how do you do a game where people want to kill shit, but a guy never is going to carry a gun or a weapon? So we created possession out of making sure that the character didn't have a gun that he carried, but you could have one, but when you lost it, it didn't feel like it got taken away. Like, these were really actually very hard design problems. And I sort of look at these design problems like really what people might consider sometimes brilliant solutions really come not from genius, but from figuring out how to create a really difficult problem to solve. Yeah, and you I, know? I think to your, to your question, you know, how do you create something that makes the player feel uh, empowered but when you're t essentially telling a linear story to tell to tell it powerfully, I think 
I think both Lauren and I would say, I mean, you just go for it and tell your linear story, but make it good. You, you know, figure I, it out. Yeah, yeah, figure out exactly what that story is. Maybe there's a couple de- deviations, but don't don't try and get into. I mean, James Cameron said it years ago because they were saying interactive movies, super highway. What's going to happen? You know, and he goes, look, man, one budget, one ending, hard yeah. enough. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Same and, budget, fifty endings, forget it. It's all going to be crap. Yeah, and I admire the people that are experimenting with, uh, you know, telling ga- stories and games without cutscenes or trying to have branching storylines or completely open game worlds, but I think it's a different beast than traditional storytelling. Mm-hmm. And I actually get a little upset and frustrated when I hear people act like it's, you know, we're approaching the death of the single player game or the linear storytelling experience because it, to me, I mean, I think it's a, it's a very powerful, when done well, enjoyable experience uh, for the player. And I mean, that was really our goal of Uncharted is to try to overcome that problem. And I think what you do is you give the player creativity and choice within constraints. It's something we kind of call shorthand inside our company, wide linear. I'm sure other people have used the same term. You don't have to have a sandbox because that actually can be ironically almost paralyzing to the player, I think, that they can do anything and go anywhere. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly hard to tell a powerful story that has the right Mm -hmm. movements and and, and pacing uh, with that. You just give them enough freedom that they feel like they're making meaningful choices within that within that path. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it comes down to quality. If somebody wants to tell me a linear story but it's crap, yeah, I'm going to resent it. But, um, you know, if, if you really try to apply everything that we've learned from watching good movies, then I think the player will go along with you as long as, again, that you get the pacing right. It, 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 I totally agree with that. And it's like we were building charts at the beginning of Stranger. I was like, what is the mechanics that that are going to ramp in? Like, what would constitute that really big payoff? And so we built a game where it's uh, he doesn't have he has a disguise, but you don't even know it. You know, so there's there's all this like bounty collecting money and stuff. Like that. And we got at a certain point that's going to get tedious. So let's just shatter what you think that's going to become and take it all away and then just go Halo 2, you know, for the last, you know, the last act. Just go balls out. No more of that game. You're busted. Now, survive. Like, and, you know, there's a lot of lessons learned in that. There's, you know, you could have done some things smarter, but when you look at it as a story, you go, at what point, what's this character's arc? At what point is this character dealing with his emotional issues? At what point is he dealing with, you know, letting go of the old, accepting the new, embracing who he really is, you know, like you would in a movie? And then you go, okay, now how does the mechanic delivery, you know, okay, now I've been playing, now I should get a new thing, I should get a new thing, I should be offered a new challenge. How does that parallel the narrative? And I think there, therein lies what I really call uh, sort of narrative game design is mastery of compromise. <laughs> you know, it's not uh-huh. like dazzlingly yeah, brilliant. It's mastering compromise. And this is where the filmmakers have a really hard time because they don't get how hard games are and how limiting it is in terms of what your creative abilities are. And how much you have to change stuff right in the middle and pull it all apart and put it back together And again. how brutal and costly that process is. Yeah, and just how creatively flexible you have to be all the time. So, know? but see, that's great. You know what? She just, just to comment, <clears throat> she just touched on a really critical part. And there's a lot of, I mean, the majority of games get released are pretty crappy. It doesn't mean the people who were built them were crappy. It just means that somehow it got pushed out before it was due. Or somehow it got greenlit when it shouldn't have. And no one goes in wanting to make a crappy game, no. right? Yeah. Exactly. So with all those things in mind, either of you want to leave, uh, go out with a little tease for your fans or anything upcoming? Any ideas, any thoughts, any just a little, you know, one-liner? There's, I mean, obviously we're continuing to plow forward with our next project, but it's nothing I can talk about publicly. <laughs> yeah, I hate to say the same, you know. All I'd say is like our leaders are waging war irresponsibly for personal gain. I think the users should be able to, too. <laughs> so I, want to get, I want to get one question. While, while, while we have Lauren, we were talking about linear stories. and like, uh, you know, Since the Quintology was in, initially announced, four games ended up coming out, only two official Quintology. Is mm-hmm. that overall story still within you? Is it still going to be told? Or absolutely. Ha- have you abandoned that? Abso- yeah. Absolutely not. No. But telling it as game first, the market conditions of the industry have changed so much right. that to sit down with what I envisioned the Quintology to be and now have it filtered through the focus testing departments and stuff, which is largely the only way you get games made today, unless you have the success record that they do. We don't, you know. We had a lot of visibility, a lot of great things happen. We're very blessed, but we're not naughty talk with 40 million games out there in sales, you know. So when we look at what can happen, it's like I go, I want to deliver them as narrative, as linear first with game components. But what happened with Munch, which was all our fault, it was like a huge 
uh, challenge for me was that the story I wanted to tell versus the one I could tell through the technology was completely polar. And so all of a sudden I go, wow, I had this epic that I wanted to do narratively, and it just got screwed down the second one mm. because of, of the technology challenges and our own, you know, mistakes and errors and, and, you know, learning the hard way. And it's really hard not to just keep carrying those yeah. mistakes forward as baggage. I mean, we definitely had to deal with that at Crystal Dynamics and, uh, you know, mistakes made along the way that we didn't, we couldn't just somehow fix and rectify and undo that we kind of had to keep, leave, keep living with them. And that's, that's hard, especially when it spans multiple projects. Well, you said something earlier, which I just want to comment on, which is the ability to go in and know you need to break it, fix it and change it. That's the difference between what makes great games and the ones that that aren't great. Yeah. Because and the people, the you, when you have producers that are going, it's too bad, here's our schedule, you don't get to fix that, you get a mediocre game. Right. And the, here, I mean, this is something we talk about all the time, and actually one of our GDC talks is going to cover this as well, is without sounding pejorative, um, we don't have producers in-house. We have producers at Sony who are very helpful in facilitating everything for us and making sure we have what we need, but... We do things that most developers or publishers would think would be insane in terms of tearing things apart and doing them over again at the very last minute and adding things at the very last minute. Lauren's got to go. do that as Lauren. well. But I do have to go. Yeah. Lauren's got to go. Hey, much it's appreciate great. you coming on. Oh, Thank pleasure. you. Thank my you very pleasure. much. Amy, nice pleasure. to see you again. And uh, for anyone listening out there, if Oddworld Stranger so is much. sitting on your... Don't forget to take off the headset before you walk away. I was going to take the whole headset out. <laughs> <laughs> if, uh, if Oddworld Stranger is sitting on your pail of shame, don't let it sit there any longer. You really should play that. I actually loved that is it game. your favorite my, Western game? Uh, well, I would say it's one of mine. Well, uh, yeah. And, yeah. yeah, and the twist is... The twist is... I know the twist. Good. Right. Yeah, the twist okay. is really good. I won't. Say, there's not enough people who played it. You should play it. it. And the guns. The field prior to the game's release. Though. I think, I think it's you're the right. One yeah. I yeah, but there's enough people who didn't uh, play yeah. it that won't remember it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. That was revealed in previous. <laughs> Thanks, Lauren. Bye. All right, and.